Everybody see okay? Is in your way? We're good. All right, we'll get started, then, guys. Uh, my name is Dr. Randy Vines. I'm a uh, 1986 grad from the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm an equine practitioner. I've been doing uh, equine medicine surgery here on the East Coast since that time. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about some practical considerations in uh, nutritional management of disease. Some common things that we see as, as veterinarians, as practitioners, and, and some common things that you'll see. I think probably at some time in, in your life you'll see the majority of things we're talking about tonight. So it, it uh, hopefully will be, again, a practical and informative thing for you. Um, one of the things that I try to, uh, to emphasize when I, when I have this lecture <clears throat> is to have you guys think in terms of an evolutionary biology standpoint where this is how horses or wild mustangs or zebras uh, evolved, and this is how they uh, this is how they manage their nutrition. And when we deviate from that, we, we can get into in problems. The other thing that uh, I, I want to uh, impress on you and try to uh, give you a few things to take home uh, about our, our we want to be very practical when we're dealing with uh, the people uh, that you're going to be dealing with in your careers. You may know that thick nutrition book. Defense of 
visual marker as first line of defense. We've all seen horses look out two or three, four hundred yards away from you at a deer or something that you, they picked up way before you did. That's their natural defense. <clears throat> that would be in a herd. So what do we do? We put them in a 12 by 12 saw with solid walls and they can't see it anywhere. They hear noise and they can't see anything. And we separate them from their, from their herd mates. We create those stressors. We also create stressors like, like down here with the with, with com competition for food. General feeding guidelines. Very simple, but stuff that you guys <coughs> should know and should easily be able to pass along to people who are fairly ignorant of uh, horses, horse behavior, and horse nutrition. Always small amounts for people. We create a lot of problems, you'll see later on in this lecture, by uh, feeding three flakes a day in the morning, running off to work or school, coming back at night, for you feeding three flakes at six o'clock at night, and then going to bed. And uh, that's a huge deviation from the way a horse's gut is set up. It's set up to be bathed in long stem roughage all day long. Half the diet ought to be in long stem roughage. At least half the diet. Concentrates and multiple concentrates or multiple feeds. A couple of comments here. <coughs> Horses aren't born with a genetic requirement for 12 pounds of sweet feet a day. Horses, from an evolutionary biology standpoint, did what? They evolved eating small amounts frequently, grazing all day long, and uh, having long stem roughage as a primary source of their diet. For a number of reasons, we started feeding uh, rough uh, uh, concentrates. Initially, oats, grain, concentrated grains, when maybe the uh, uh, the long stem roughage wasn't available in the wintertime for horses, or many times when the horses were working hard and you couldn't maintain their body weight, either lactating mares, race horses, draft horses pulling plows, you couldn't maintain their body weight very well just on long stem roughage. They needed concentrated energy. So we started feeding, feeding more concentrates. Concentrates are, are still, uh, in many cases, not necessary for, for uh, maintenance of body weight in horses unless it's a really uh, uh, strongly performing horns or a lactating mare. But they may well be necessary in an environment that we've created for the horse where it's essentially a monoculture environment or a mono food environment where the horse doesn't get to graze that pasture 20 or 30 different uh, varieties of plants. They eat orchard grass hay all the time. And concentrates are a great supplement for uh, a narrow diet that a horse has to make sure we're providing the vitamins and minerals and protein requirements that a horse uh, needs. <clears throat> the need for multiple feeds. This is something that is, is uh, forever a problem uh, when, when you go into a horse barn. You, you ask them what the horse is eating and they'll say, well, he's out on pasture and he gets hay and then I feed him the sweet feed, but he loves these pellets too and, you know, I give him rice bran and that. And of course, he's got to have his, his, uh, his mash too. He's got to have his uh, heat pulp mash and, and then he likes his alfalfa cubes too. And so, so People love to do that. They love to formulate their own diets for horses. And if you can, if you can steer people away from that, you're much better off. Once you, as you know from this class, once you start mixing all these things together, you don't know, you don't know what you have. Certainly, the barn owner, the horse, the horse owner, doesn't know what they have. A ton of research goes into the concentrated diets that are commercially available for horses. You only need one in most in most circumstances. You can pick your company, or it's Purina or Triple Crown or whatever, whatever feed that you're feeding. Uh, but they have a number of diets that are formulated to complement decent quality hay and provide the nutritional requirements for, uh, for a horse. You're not going to be having a typical horse owner formulate rations. It's a great exercise for you, for you guys because it helps you with, with, with your knowledge of nutrition. But practically, you've got five minutes of horse owner attention, and you need to get a few bullet points across to them. And one of those things is, you don't need eight different types of foods for this horse. You don't need that for it to gain weight. Many, many times it'll be, I'm feeding him this sweet feed, and I'm not getting the weight on him that I want to get on him, and so what else should I feed him? You don't need anything else. You need a little more of the same meat, maybe more hay, maybe more concentrated feed, but you don't need to mix and match uh, a smorgasbord variety of foods for uh, feedstuffs, concentrated feedstuffs for a horse. If you get away from that, the horse will Horses, dogs, cats with commercially available diets eat way better than we do. Keep them on one diet and know what you're doing there. Don't, don't mix and match a bunch of different varieties. No greater than five pounds of concentrate per feeding. Has anybody discussed that with you? Why that's an important thing? When you, when you have, uh, <clears throat> it seems like the, the cutoff is at about five pounds. When you have more than five pounds of concentrate at one time, the horse eats 
that fairly rapidly, and it won't get digested where it's supposed to be digested primarily, which is the small intestine. A lot of that will bypass the small intestine, given the large colon, the large intestine, seek of it that large colon, and uh, cause some fermentation problems. You can cause an acidosis that way, you can cause gas buildup, and increase your risk of, of uh, GI irritation, GI problems. Of course, you've probably been, you've heard this all before, feed by weight, not by volume. I give them two scoops twice a day, Doc. Two scoops of what? What scoops? And we all know that a scoop of feathers doesn't weigh the same as a scoop of rocks. A scoop of oats doesn't weigh the same as a scoop of corn. You've got to go by weight. You've got to go by weight. Volumes uh, just are not very reliable. Calorie density by weight of different sweet feeds, different commercially available concentrated feeds, is fairly similar. It's not identical. Certainly there are low starch and low carb diets, uh, low cow diet for diets for horses, but when you're feeding by weight, you won't be that far off. If you're feeding by volume, you can be way off as far as uh, the amount of calories you're getting. And of course, free, free choice water, goes without saying. Questions about that? Does this nutrition course that include any uh, uh, of course, uh, GI anatomy. We've been, through, we've been through that pretty well. All right, I'll, I'll just go through that quickly. And again, this is, I want you to think about this in terms of uh, basic ideas, and this is, a, this is a, pr a plumbing problem. You've got esophagus, stomach, small intestine, 72 feet of small intestine. You've got about 100 feet of intestine from, from mouth anus, roughly 100 feet. After it goes through the small intestine, it goes to see the large colon. Then the small colon and, and uh, out the rectum. Very, very basic uh, horse anatomy. They are hind gut for minutes. So again, ingestion uh, and digestion is a hundred foot journey. It takes some time. It starts with the lips. You have cutting and pulling incisors. The roof of the mouth is ratcheted. You've seen the roof of a horse's mouth. Wondered why that is. That helps get the horse's food to the back of the mouth. The tongue does this kind of thing and keeps moving the food back to the molars. Premolars and molars, there's six cheek teeth on, on top and bottom, both sides. And that's where the, that's where the journey begins. Esophagus, three or four feet in length. <clears throat> it's basically just a plumbing again. It's a pipe to get things from the mouth down to the stomach. The stomach holds about three or four gallons, a little bit more if you want to extend it. So, uh, horses are not able to regurgitate. It's not a normal thing for them to do. If they're regurgitating, if you have, if you have stomach contents coming out of the uh, nose, you have a tremendous amount of pressure built up on that stomach. That's not a common thing for horses to, uh, to do. The GI transit time to stomach is about half an hour. And as you know, the predominant acid in the stomach is hydrochloric acid. Horses are fixed rate secretors of hydrochloric acid. They're not like you and I, where we see pizza and a beer and we start salivating. And Secreting HCL or stomach pH goes down. Their stomach pH is down all the time because of the uh, HCL continuous secretion. Small intestine is about 70 of those 100 feet. It holds about 10, 10 gallons of ingesta. And believe it or not, it only takes about an hour or two for that food to get through the small intestine. The food doesn't take a long time to go through there, a couple hours. The time is spent in the seat of the large colon. There again, high gut fermenters. Food is going to sit there for you know, a day, a day and a half. It's going to sit there and ferment for a day, day and a half. That's where all your, your time is spent for the ingestion. Small colon is about 12 feet long. Could hold up to about 5 gallons. A large colon is going to hold the largest volume through 20 gallons or so. Rectum, really just a reservoir for the fecal walls until they're passed out of the horse. The small colon is what uh, absorbs a fair amount of water back from the ingestion. Questions about the, the, the GI tract. And again, we're not, we're not going to get into, heavy into uh, uh, GI physiology, but I wanted you to mainly think of this and, and when, you, when you're formulating your story to tell to somebody that absolutely has no idea what goes on under the skin of a horse or in the abdomen, think of it in terms of, of a plumbing problem. There are some one-way valves, things don't come back like they do with a person or a dog or a cat. And it's about it's about 24 it's about 24 to 36 hour process to get 
through there, and most of the time is set in that beer vat that's the large colon and, and, and uh, sequin. So the first disease we're going to talk about, we're going to go through some diseases and, and the nutritional management of those diseases uh, for the rest of the, uh, the class. And this is one of the most common things we see, star starvation. If you're feeding the horse minimally, it's going to take 60 to 90 days to starve. It takes a while to do this. It's a, this horse does not get this way in a week's time. I hear that story quite often. It didn't look this way last week or the week before. And uh, he was headed this way. It has been for a long time. So it takes 60 to 90 days to starve them. It takes 6 to 10 months to return them safely to a normal body weight. You're not going to be able to do that overnight. Once you start starving the horse, they get into a catabolic state fairly quickly. You have muscle weakness, impaired GI function. The, the GI tract essentially atrophies just like the muscles do. Uh, you have impaired immune response. They can't fight infection. You have delayed healing. All these things, you know, worse than starving. Within a day, day and a half, you get increased glucose, insulin, and increased glucose, uh, cortisol, and it results in a catabolic state where the horse is basically digesting uh, the, the fats and proteins uh, in the body. You get a lot of mobilization of, of fatty acids. The basal metabolic rate starts to decrease. This all happens within a day, day and a half. It starts to happen within a day, day and a half when you, uh, when you stop feeding the horse. And uh, I'll pause here for a second because it's very easy to look at this horse and start to get pretty angry with the horse owner. And I can tell you that 95% of these cases are not vicious people, mean-spirited people. This is a problem of ignorance. It's a problem of people buying a horse or having a horse, not knowing what a horse, normal horse would look like, not feeling under that big shaggy winter coat, buying a horse in the, in, in the summer or early fall, putting a blanket on it for the winter, never taking the blanket off. And then the phone call we get is the cold weather phone call on my horse is down and can't get up. And the reason this horse can't get up is because he doesn't have any muscle mass in him. So he, he's eaten all his muscle mass and he just uh, doesn't have the energy. Once they lay down, they don't have the energy to get back up. That's the typical call from an ignorant uh, a person that's, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but it's a person that's, that, that is ignorant of, of horse body condition and, and uh, feeds and nutrition is my horse is down and can't get up. So, this is the starving horse. Again, many, many times, most of the time, it's not malicious at all. How do you treat these guys? First thing you want to do is start rehydration. You're going to give them a gallon an hour until they're satisfied, until they're saved. So you give them an hour, a gallon an hour, and when there's water left over in the bucket, fill the bucket up. Pretty simple, straightforward. Don't fill the bucket up and have them drink 10 gallons right away. A gallon an hour, and then when they're done, when there's water left over, then they get free choice. Then you start feeding at about 70% of uh, maintenance requirements. Small amounts frequently, four to six times a day. If you can feed more frequently than that, the more times the better. If you want NSCs, less than 20% of the diet. Ideally. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but that's a uh, uh, that's the kind of diet you want, 70% of maintenance. You're not going to uh, make the mistake of coming in feeding them twice what another normal body condition horse will have because you want them to gain weight the day. That's going to cause a problem. You want to start them out at 70% and you transition to maintenance diet, 100% of maintenance, over about a two-week period. You do that because the GI tract it has been atrophied also. If you, don't, if you look at the uh, his, histopath slide of, of the, the small intestine or colon and the horse has been starving. They don't have a normal dental structure there. They can't digest and absorb the way uh, a normal horse can. And if you feed too much too fast, you get into a refeeding syndrome. You can kill horses by, by doing this. Excess non-structural carbs, a lot of sugars, increases insulin, basically it increases glucose uptake and drives uh, uh, and, uh, and causes a, uh, uh, a situation where you have low electrolytes. Uh, electrolytes. And you can have uh, cardiac arrhythmias from this uh, that can kill a horse. So you can have a refeeding injury or a refeeding syndrome where you get to this horse and he's still standing up looking okay. You start pouring sugars to him and, and carbs to him to uh, uh, hopefully turn the corner. You've done too much and then he dies, he dies 48 hours later. So you want to do this slowly. It took him a long time to get there. It took him a long, it's going to take him a long time to get back. If the horse is anorexic, we feed him by stomach tube. 
If they're so weak they can't eat, we'll feed them by stomach too. Again, 70%. And about 67 gallons per day. The rule of thumb for you would be 60, 60 milliliters per kilogram. But 6 to 7 gallons of water per day for a horse. You're going to tube them several times a day. Um, sometimes we'll put an indwelling tube in, uh, like this horse has. And uh, I'm not a Purina salesman, I don't get a commission off this, but Purina makes a great product now called Well Gel. It's a powder that you rehydrate and it's easy to pump through a tube like this. And I think it's around 3 pounds uh, will meet the protein, vitamin, and mineral requirements of a horse for a 24 hour period. So it's concentrated, it's easy to stomach tube the horse. You don't have to stomach tube it, if the horse is eating, it's a great top dress to, to increase protein in the horse. It's got glutamine in it too, that helps uh, endocytes and cells lining the GI tract also. So, so it's a, that's, a, a, that's a great problem. That's how you manage the starving horse. And again, you're, gonna, you're going to uh, uh, feed these guys over a six to a 10 month period to get them back. Okay, you're looking at you're, you're you're hoping to get an increase. I don't know if I have mine or not. You're hoping to get an increase in, in body condition score of one score every four to six weeks. So you find this horse is a one or two. You're hoping to get it to a three in four to six weeks, not four or five days. One BCS score in four to six weeks. Okay, then we have the opposite problem. I photoshopped this a little bit, but not much. Uh, obesity is a real problem in, in this area, and, and it is a uh, it's a uh, real it puts horses at, at a great risk for for uh, metabolic disease and, and uh, conditions that are uh, sensitive to obesity, for, uh, laminitis, for example. We cause most of the laminitis in horses in this area of the country by allowing them to get obese, overfeeding them. This, so this is a this is an epidemic problem. We're going to talk a little bit later about Cushing's disease and metabolic uh, syndrome, insulin resistance, those kind of things. But just basic obesity is a very common problem here. These horses have an eight or nine body condition score, uh, and again, the primary problem is the owner. They don't recognize the conditions. They'll be the opposite of the people who don't recognize it's the starving horse. This horse is putting on pounds every year, every year, every year. And finally, it's more of the obese animal. And the, and the comment is usually the same. I don't know how to get so fat, Doc. He's only getting, you know, just getting a handful of grain twice a day. Where is he getting this obesity from here in Bucks County? From the pasture, right? This, this, this pony is on two nice of a pasture. It's on a beautiful pasture, probably free choice A. He's going to get obese like this whether there's concentrated feed in his diet or not. How do you treat it? It's pretty simple. You recognize that you have the problem, diet and exercise. You aim for a reduction of one score every four to six weeks. It's just the opposite of the, uh, uh, of the starvation case. High fiber diet, exercise, and you're going to do this gradually also. You don't starve these horses. When you starve a horse like this, especially a pony, they mobilize fatty acids a little too fast. You can have uh, hepatitis problems. Fatty liver syndrome when, when you change diet too drastically. You have all the time in the world to make this horse better. You just need to start moving in that direction and counsel an owner uh, uh, about the source of, uh, of calories. People just don't understand uh, uh, where the calories come from in a horse's diet. They think it's in that bag of sweet feed, and many times there is, they will be feeding too much sweet feed. But again, these horses get fat because they're out on pasture, lush pasture for nine months of the year free choice A, and they're not exercising. Get them on that high fiber diet, and you're going to have to probably limit their pasture time or muscle. Muscles will, will uh, give you roughly an 80% reduction in uh, grass intake, depending on the hole size in the, in the muscle. So you're going to limit pasture time. Muscles are a great thing because they allow horses to be out moving around and still not take in massive amounts of calories. Uh, or you can use hay nets, sometimes multiple hay nets. Some horses get pretty darn good at pulling hay out of hay nets in a short amount of time. So you have to play with these things a, a little bit and, and, and uh, consider the environment you're in, what limitations you have. You may, uh, you may have to do any of the above. But the point here is you have to 
reduce the caloric intake and get this, this horse moving. Many, many times it's, it's much easier to uh, reduce the calories than it is to find a family that has enough time to actually exercise these horses enough to get them to lose weight. Yes? Um, if you're like, just meeting the long sand, like, say that would make long sand body weight and should keep that weight up on it. And then he's not like, eating constantly. Do you have any problems with like, the stomach and the red blood acid in it? How do you balance that? Can you, yeah, that's a good question. How do you balance the, the, uh, uh, the, the GI problem and the concentrate rate uh, uh, HCL secretion with uh, a re restricted diet? And I think the best way to do it is we don't eliminate this diet. The, the worst way to manage this horse is to say, say that this pony is to say, you know, really only needs two flakes of hay a day. Give it one flake in the morning and one at night. Horses need uh, to spend time chewing. It, it, it keeps them occupied. And so if, you, if, if you're... Uh, Feeding this guy twice a day, he's going to start developing behavior problems, cribbing, uh, weaving, stall walking, uh, chewing the wood in your, in, in your stall. You don't want that to happen. That's why a hay net really, really helps. You want this guy maybe to only take in a couple of flakes of hay, but you want him to take almost all day to do that. Uh, there are little interval feeder, feeders available also uh, that, that you can, uh, that are time feeders. Every 20 minutes, they'll kick out a handful of food. So you can manage them with that also, but you, you'll go a long way just with hay nets, making them work for uh, for their diet or, or using muscle. Muscles don't only have to be used in a pasture. You can use a muscle in a stall. You may have to adjust the, the, the muscle size, the, the whole size, uh, but you can uh, you can actually uh, use them for a number of uh, uh, different diets. So the goal is uh, on the bottom here. People say, well, how, how much do you feed them for weight reduction? And this is a pretty simple formula. You start out at 2% of body weight, dry matter intake for four to six weeks, and see if there's any change. Again, we're not trying to get this done tomorrow. We're trying to improve the quality of this horse's life for, for the next 10 years. 2% dry matter intake for four to six weeks. If you get no, if you start to see a reduction, you get that one body condition store, score, or even less. If you start to head in the right way, use your weight tape. Uh, and you're headed in the right direction, you may stay on that. But if you're not getting a reduction, then go down to uh, uh, one and a half. That's wrong on there. You go down to one and a half percent body weight drive that every day for another four or six weeks. And then you go down to one percent body weight drive that every day if it's necessary. Most horses, you don't have to be this grass. Many horses, if you just get them down to two percent instead of the four percent that they're eating, You'll, uh, you'll see a reduction in, in, uh, in weight. And you're going to have to weigh that. You have to really counsel somebody to weigh that because uh, they, they'll be all over the place with what a flake of hay weighs or what a scoop of rain weighs. Yes? Sorry, can I just ask the offset question? Like if, you, if your horse is a hard keeper and you're trying to get weight on them and they're already consuming more than like the NXE recommendations um, for gaining a um, weight class or body condition score, what's the safest percent body weight? Well, what we try to do is, I don't think we, you can say this, in forage, it can be free choice. Okay, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What we try to do is, if you're trying to get weight gain, if I have a, if we have a skinny horse, not the starvation case, but the horse is about a, a body condition score of three or four, or something like that, and one of you up to five or six, um, what we'll do is we'll uh, first counsel somebody to go to free choice hay. Because again, that long stem roughage is very important for the horse. Uh, from a dietary standpoint, um, heat, heat creation, keep the mind occupied. So we'll get them to free choice hay. And many times in that horse, free choice hay will be enough to get uh, uh, the horse to gain weight. If that doesn't happen, then we'll start to increase the, the grain and we'll do that at about 20%, 25% increments. So if the horse is getting four pounds of grain, they will go up to five. And we'll wait three or four weeks, check the weight tape, look at the horse, feel the horse, and see if we're making a difference. We don't want to do anything drastic mm -hmm. in the starving horse or the obese horse. We just want to start moving in that direction and maintain that. We want to counsel people that there is a tremendous seasonality to caloric intake in many, in many environments, in, in, especially in, in this area. They're going to take in a ton of, of, of uh, calories in pasture grass. If they have pasture available, there's going to be a huge difference. They're going to take a ton of calories in from Easter to Thanksgiving they, because there's a lot of grass. It's going to die. It's going to be covered with snow. It's going to be eaten down to nothing in a mud lot, whatever, from Thanksgiving to Easter. 
So there's a huge difference. And uh, when, when you see horses in the springtime that are very skinny, and the same horses in the whole population of the farm fairly fat in the fall, that's somebody that doesn't recognize the caloric density of the horses that, that, that the horse are taking in, in their pastures. And they don't, they don't, uh, uh, they don't uh, make the necessary changes for that. That's the starvation problem. Horse looks great in the summer. Somebody puts a blanket on it. They bring it in. and got a flake in the morning, a flake at night all summer. Hey, they keep it occupied. They stay on the flake twice a day. And they discount all the calories that used to come into that pasture for six months or five months. And this is the look that you have in that starvation horse in February or March. They'll say, this is what I fed him all along. But they totally discount the amount of the caloric density and the caloric intake of a good pasture. And the seasonality of that. Question about obesity. Okay, impaction problem. I'm sorry these are a little bit blurry here, but this is a this is a surgery table, large colon is, is here. This is somebody's hand to give you the idea of the size of an impacted large colon. That's that's what you're looking at when you do that. That's pretty much the entire large colon on the on the surgery table. And again, the head of the surgeon and somebody's hand for for reference. This is a pretty big organ. And uh, it really gets uh, filled with uh, with dry with hay. You tend to see this in fall, or winter environments, or uh, when horses are traveling, or somebody that really intermittently feeds twice a day feed. This is a hay problem. They don't get impacted. In the, uh, the, the, the impaction we're talking about that doesn't happen in in. Uh, with uh, grass. It doesn't really happen with uh, sweet feeds or, or concentrated diets. This is a horse that eats a lot of hay and doesn't drink a lot of water. And so you see that in the time of year we're entering right now. We've got a couple of those cases at the office right now that are that are impaction colleagues. Something happens where the horse changes the percent of moisture in their diet and that sets this up in addition to the intermittent feeding. I'll give you a couple classic examples. Uh, the travel example is the horse that comes up from Florida and uh, or comes to uh, Pennsylvania from Texas is on the trailer for two days. He's bored in the stall in the uh, trailer, and people keep a hay net in front of him all the time. Why? Horses like hay, keeps them happy. And they get off at three or four rest stops on the way. The horse doesn't like the, the uh, way the water smells, so he doesn't drink the water. But they keep feeding him hay, they keep him happy. So he's had six, eight, ten flakes of hay in a two-day period, and he. And, his water consumption may be 25% of what it, what it should be. That's the typical horse that, that gets off the trailer here with an impaction. Some people have enough problems with it in their travels or have been burnt by it enough time that they'll actually have us come out and uh, stomach the horse with mineral oil prior to a long trip to provide a lax, a little bit of lax. I'm not saying you have to do that, but you need to be cognizant of what this horse is eating and what they're, what they're drinking. If they're not drinking any water, you're, you're at risk for this. You want to cut back on that hay consumption, spread it way out, cut back on it. The other, the, other, the intermittent example is uh, a busy student or a busy, busy mom or dad uh, throws three or four hay, uh, flakes of hay into the stall in the morning. The horse eats that in a short amount of time. And this big bolus of hay goes through that gut that's supposed to be bathed 18 to 20, uh, 16 to 18 hours a day with small amounts. Big bolus of hay, maybe the water's frozen. And then they come back and, uh, and do the same thing at 6 or 7 o'clock at night. It's cold. You want to get in the house and watch mom and family. So you throw four flakes of hay in and, and, you, and you, you go in the house. And, and uh, that is a big risk factor. This doesn't happen very much in the summer. The horses are hot. They're taking in many times uh, pasture grasses that are much higher in moisture than the, than the dry hay is. And they'll be hot. They'll drink more in the summer. So, so it's not so much a summer problem as it is a fall, winter, or intermittent feeding problem. How do you treat it? It's going to be managed with pain medication, uh, laxative, mineral oil, mag sulfate, and Epsom salts is a, is a laxative, and IV fluids in more difficult cases. Most of these cases you can solve on the farm with uh, uh, pain management and, and some laxatives. No reason to give a horse any more food until they're comfortable with passing the door. Very common mistake to see a horse with a shot of banamine or just intermittently comfortable with this problem, people feeding it more. There is no good reason to feed a horse um, with abdominal pain until that problem is resolved. Many times we give them a handful, literally a handful, to see what their attitude is and if they're willing to eat as a gauge of how comfortable they are, but no volume should go into a horse with abdominal pain, period, until that gets
to sort it out. So how do you prevent it? It goes back to the same old evolutionary biology thing that I want to harp on for you, which is small amounts frequently. Whatever you're doing in managing a horse's diet, if you can break it up into smaller amounts more frequently, it goes a long way to prevent a lot of these problems. Ensure adequate water consumption. You can use mild laxatives when uh, the horse is at risk. So we don't necessarily have to stomach feed this horse with mineral oil, but you may want to top dress the sweet feed with a cup or two of mineral oil uh, for a couple of days before the horse travels. That may be just enough laxative to keep things moving through the GI tract. If you know that horse is going to travel, make sure you're giving small amounts frequently. The bottom bullet point is something that a, a lot of people uh, uh, make the mistake on. They'll, they, they'll give a couple of horse a couple of cups of, of corn oil. That's not a laxative. Corn oil is like you or I eating Snickers bar. It's fat, but where's the fat get digested and absorbed? In the small intestine, right? So, I mean, you, you might get some laxative effect with a gallon of corn oil, but uh, in bypassing the small intestine. But if you're giving corn oil in, in, in a cup or two a day and you're thinking you're giving it as a laxative, you're not. That gets digested and absorbed. It's pure fat. It's digested and absorbed primarily in the small intestine, and it's not a laxative. Mineral oil is a common laxative. That's what we use to treat this, and that's what you can use. Very safe. Comes out the anus in the same, in the same way it goes uh, through the stomach tube or in, in the mouth. It's, uh, it's not digested or absorbed. It's purely a lubricant and a, and a laxative. Question about impaction colic. This is one of the most common types of colic that you'll see, especially this time of year. Yes? Um, so if you Yeah, you, there's no formula for that. If you're going from one to two flakes, you probably would be okay. If the horse is eating, let's say, four to six flakes per day, and you're increasing that diet by 20%, something like that, mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be a big problem. Okay. Um, and again, our worlds don't allow us to do what's ideal for the horse. Mm -hmm. If you're feeding horse six flakes a day, and you can feed them six times a day, that's awesome. Yeah. If you're doing it for two times a day, it's not so good. And by, don't make the mistake of thinking that six times a day means every four hours uh, on the hour. It doesn't. If you could break that feeding up and separate those two flakes a day by an hour or two, you've really helped in the volume that's passing through the GI tract. You can do just a couple hours. So, so the people that feed twice a day, we try to get them to feed right when, you know, in the morning. They go off to work, come home from work, feed then, and then feed again at uh, before bedtime. If you can go from two times to three times, it's a big help. All right? Three times to four. Anything you can do to, uh, to stretch that out. If you have two flakes, maybe you put it in the hay net. Again, that's, you, can, you can give that three flakes at one time, you put it in the hay net, and they're going to eat it much, much slower. Any other questions? I'm move along here then. Equine gastric ulcer syndrome. You've probably heard a lot about that. Again, uh, these guys are. severe uh, stomach ulcers in the, in, in the horse. There are continuous HCL secretors, 25 to 50% of foals, 60 to 90% of adult horses in certain environments can have uh, gastric ulcers. And really, this deal is because of stress, intermittent feeding, and the fact that they are continuous uh, secretors of, of, of HCL. So that's the big, that's the big takeaway message. And what you want to do is bathe the gut in, in hay if you can to absorb a lot of that HCL keep your pH a little higher than what would be in the, uh, the horse's stand around the stall with nothing to do between the two times that you feed per day. Causes, stress. The horse, you, you see these ulcers in sick animals, you see the horses at the racetrack, they're in an environment where they're, they're, maybe they're a young animal, they're under a lot of stress, they're eating intermittently, they may have a high concentrated diet, uh, you, they can be caused by uh, non or anti-inflammatory drugs or steroids, uh, so there can be um, pharmaceutical causes of, of, of the ulcers. Uh, foals are particularly sensitive to uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Treatment. The first and foremost thing to do long term is to create a more natural environment. Try to do whatever you can to minimize the stress. You're not going to take the horse away from the racetrack, but if you could get that hay net up all the time and do anything you can to minimize the stress so the animal's bathing that gut in food, you're going to really help yourself. So create that natural environment that they've the gut and food. Uh, always a question about antacids. Do we have antacids or Tums type products? And uh, the, the answer is yes, but they don't work very long. They work well for us because what do we do? We're intermittent secretors of stomach acid.
ice. And so you, uh, you uh, start salivating, you take a couple tums, and you'll neutralize your stomach acid for a while, and you'll be okay because you're going to stop secreting it in a little while. And acids work in horses, but you have to use them probably 12 to 20 times a day to keep the pH uh, more, more buffered. So do they work? Yes. Practically, can you do it? Can you feed them and, and get a practical benefit? No. They don't work because you're not going to feed this horse every hour and acids. So we go to uh, the medications that, that uh, will, will fix uh, equine stomach ulcers. And there are a couple of classes of those. The H2 receptor agents would be things like tagamet or cymetamine. And then uh, the proton pump inhibitor is, uh, is omeprazole, the most common one. That's gastrodarm. Everybody knows it by brand names, gastrodarm. The great product. One tube of that, 24 hours. It's a, it's a great product. Again, I don't, I don't uh, get any commission for, for, for talking about one product, but, but I'm telling you that's the, that's the way to, to fix ulcers. That's the way to fix ulcers, and the way to keep them away is, is to approximate a more natural environment. Continuous feeding increases stress. Question about ulcers? Yes? Um, I also, my horse has ulcers right now. What we think he does. He's been dealing with like health issues with him for a while now. And, uh, people at my neck have decided that ulcers is the route we're going to go with now. Uh -huh. um, I've heard that feeding like alfalfa helps too. I don't know if there's any like studies done on that, but I think, think about it. I think there has been, but I, th I think the overwhelming take home message is whatever you're feeding, feed continuously. Right. It's way more important to feed the food continuously than it is. Orchard grass can be not right. okay. Yeah, that's the that's the way to, the way to go. And if you have a question, how do you diagnose stomach ulcers? The real way to diagnose them is uh, with a scope again, gastroscopy. You run a scope down and get a picture, get a look at what's going on in that stomach. Uh, back door way to diagnose them, many people will will do if they can't get to a scope, is uh, five to seven days of gastro. The worst changes. Uh, Significantly in that amount of time, in a week's time, the gastric are strongly suggested that you have a stomach ulcer. It's not, you know, diagnostic, but it's very strongly suggested that that's the problem. Colitis. You may see this, you, you may not. There are many causes of, of colitis. Again, fairly blurry image for you, I apologize, but what you're looking at is the rear end of the horse that's painting the stall with green water. Uh, you can see this is, this is all diarrhea here shooting out of his rear end, three or four feet, hitting the stall, and then just sliding down the, the stall. This is inflamed colon, cecum and colon. Um, there are many, many causes, uh, viral causes, bacterial causes, pathomic horse fever, salmonella. Uh, antibiotics can cause this at, uh, at times. Rapid feed changes. Feeding too much concentrate, like acidosis. This can be a serious life-threatening problem. It may be contagious if it's one of these Clostridial or salmonella caused colitis cases. And they get very, very thick and angry. The colon gets very, very, uh, uh, very angry. Hypersecretory, you'll see you'll lose protein through the colon. Uh, and it's a, a situation where sometimes it'll double or triple the thickness. It's sick. It doesn't do a very good a job of, of uh, doing anything until it heals. Many times it will heal uh, to keep the horse alive long enough with a lot of fluids. And the dietary management of, it, of these uh, cases is, again, small amounts frequently. This is a very sick, angry colon, and you can't fill them up with a large volume of, of hard-to-digest roughages. You have to feed them small amounts of highly digestible roughage, in addition to sometimes concentrated feeds to help them uh, maintain their protein because these horses will really secrete a lot of fluids and uh, a lot of nutrition, a lot of protein out into the lumen of that colon and it'll pass right out as diarrhea. So these are treated basically supporting them until they get, if they get the problem uh, uh, resolved. Uh, but from a dietary standpoint, you're going to feed these guys the best quality food you have, again, in small amounts frequently because that sick colon can't uh, can't handle six or eight flights of hay a day. I'm sorry, would you say that colitis is 
It just means basically information of the intestine? Yeah, of the colon. Of the okay. of the cecum and colon. Okay. Uh, it's the large colon. Yeah. Okay. There are other conditions of the small intestine. That's a good mm -hmm. question. Other conditions of the small intestine that we would discuss separately. But this is, uh, small intestine conditions aren't going to give you this kind of diarrhea. If you're losing this kind of volume of fluid mm -hmm. in a horse, you have uh, most likely colitis. Almost always. And these horses will lose a lot of fluids. Nothing for us to have to give 100, uh, uh, 100, 200 liters of IV fluids to replace this loss. So this is a, this is a uh, large volume of fluid. Choke. Another GI problem that can be managed many times from a dietary standpoint. Horses choke for two basic reasons. One uh, is a behavioral thing. Remember we talked about competition and eating. They're going to be bolting the food, eating the food uh, quick. They have uh, uh, fear or sometimes an unreasonable fear that somebody's going to take their, their, their food. They don't necessarily know that horse in the next stall can't get to their corner feeder of concentrated feed. So they're going to eat quickly. They're not going to chew as, uh, as thoroughly as, as maybe they should. Or there may be a physi physiologic problem. You have a horse with bad dentition. You have a horse with a stricture in the esophagus. Uh, there are neurologic causes that will, uh, that will cause a, a horse to choke. And the choke in a horse is uh, a bowl of food stuff, stuck in the esophagus. We choke, we can't breathe. Horses choke, they can breathe fine, but they can't swallow anything. Something is stuck in the plumbing of that esophagus. There's a plug of food there. So they try to swallow, and it comes back up and with a bunch of saliva, and they'll cough and extend their neck, and this kind of thing will come out of their nose. That's just chewed hay and uh, saliva. You'll see a lot of saliva. Uh, many people underestimate the volume of saliva that horses secrete in a day's time. So you see a big puddle of saliva on the floor with food in it like this, uh, you probably have a choke. Many of these will resolve on their own. Sometimes we have to treat them and uh, you know, pass the stomach tube and push this plug of food into, uh, down into the sun. The way you manage these problems, is, regardless really of the cause, is you try to slow the intake. You try to slow the intake, uh, take away the stressors. Feed the horse in the environment where it doesn't feel like he's going to get robbed of his food if he doesn't get it done in the next seven minutes. So he'll slow down and chew it appropriately and swallow it. If he's really into bolting this food, you can put a couple large rocks in his feet and make him push those around, that'll slow them down many times just enough that, that, uh, that they won't uh, choke or it'll, 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 it'll decrease the incidence of choke significantly. Soft diets. This usually is a hay or a pellet, pellet problem. For some reason they chew the pellets and one bite on a pellet makes it feel like it's been chewed and it doesn't get mixed, mixed maybe with the appropriate amount of saliva and gets stuck. Yes? Sorry, um, you know by adding stones, could you get potentially like um, teeth damage? No. No, you won't. You won't. You know, we're, we're, we're not, when we're talking about stones, we're talking about something that's maybe this big. Oh. Two or three of those in your feed bin in the corner, okay. and you pour your grain in there, and the horse has to root around that a little bit, and that slows them down just enough. You wouldn't put small rocks in. We're talking about boulder, okay. you know, something, something big, okay. to uh, to make them work a little bit more to get the food in mm -hmm. that, That's all. Yes? Um, are there any the, the salt block in the feed bin, too, to like, slow down? Is that where mm -hmm. it's the same? It's the same idea. It's the same thing. Some people will do that. Other people will think that maybe the horse is taking a little too much salt if there's if you're doing that. But it depends on the horse. But it's the same idea. Question about choke. I know we're rushing through these things, but I don't keep you too late. Um, Cushing's disease. We're going to discuss with uh, insulin resistance and metabolic disease because although they're treated. Uh, the drugs that you use may be a little bit different. The, um, the uh, dietary management of these guys is very similar. So the Cushing disease horses have a pituitary adenoma, they have a pituitary growth, and uh, elevated cortisol related problems. So the PUPD are drinking an excess amount of water, they're urinating excessively, uh, they have this long shaggy hair coat sweating many times, they're the immune suppressed, have an increased risk of laminitis. We did a couple of tests you can use to diagnose that problem. And those guys are treated with pergolide exercise and again uh, weight control and uh, uh, a, uh, a dietary measure. Metabolic syndrome is an insulin resistance problem 
a little bit different than a person uh, that's a diabetic. With, with what, uh, uh, what people in dogs and cats generally have is uh, uh, lack of insulin production. So you get high blood sugar and, and uh, you don't have much insulin. Horses are a little bit different. They tend to be able to make insulin okay and the cells get resistant to, uh, to it. So the horse that's insulin resistant may have had a normal blood sugar, but it takes a lot of insulin to maintain that blood sugar where it's supposed to be. So they'll have a, a very elevated uh, insulin level. And that can bring up, it brings bone set problems. You can, you can inject a horse with a high enough level of insulin to cause laminitis just with, with, with an injection. So we, we, uh, we worry a lot about uh, uh, the, the diet of these guys, making, making sure that, they're managed, uh, that their weight loss, or their weight program is, is and their dietary management is, is up to snuff, because that's uh, the most important thing you can do for them. Again, they have abnormal de uh, fat deposition. They tend to be big and have increased laminitis risk. <clears throat> their insulin levels are going to be elevated. Some people have tried metformin on them. There's big, mixed results with that. Some horses seem to respond. Other horses, you don't get much uh, response. But the real way you treat both of these guys, other than the difference in, in uh, drugs, is uh, by managing the, the diet, getting these guys to exercise, uh, managing the obesity that, that, that is happening in many of these cases. And you're going to do that uh, at minimizing the, uh, the simple carbs. So you're going to decrease. The NSCs, you want a lower starch diet, depending on the source, you may have read this already, depending on the source, uh, some people will say somewhere below, below 15-70%. Uh, there are some diets that are out there that are around 11% uh, NSCs made for these kind of horses. This is a hot topic, it's an epidemic problem, and most feed companies will have a low starch diet for metabolic disease or Cushing's uh, horses. <coughs> Find to pasture these guys. You want to have them in longer grass pastures because uh, have you discussed this, the starch issue in plants pretty well? So you, you know that most of these NSCs are going to be in the lower part of the plant. So if you have a longer pasture, horses are going to longer pasture grasses are going to probably take in some less starch. You don't want stressed pastures. You want to do that AM grazing uh, before they do a lot of photosynthesis and build up a lot of uh, starches. Overnight or AM grazing. Hey. If you have the opportunity, test it. In certain situations, you're getting a 40 or 50 bales of hay from uh, one source or different sources, and it may not be practical for you to test every shipment, but if you get the same cutting from the same farmer that's got thousands of bales in his barn, it is beneficial for you to, to do uh, forage analysis. Do testing. And again, I'm sure you've already heard that, that you can't look at these hays and tell uh, about nutrient quality, whether we're talking about protein or NSCs. You need to do a forage analysis. Soaking, you can get up to, I think it's maybe 25% or so, 27% maximum reduction of NSCs if you soak for 16 hours. So for half an hour to an hour, you might get 5% reduction. So you can soak hay. That's not always practical in the wintertime when it's 5 degrees. But that is one uh, thing you can do to decrease the, the uh, carbs. And again, in the obese cases, you're going to decrease the work in day. Back the same way we would manage the, the obese horse. You're going to uh, exercise those guys, you're going to decrease your grazing time, muzzle them, hay nets, those kind of things. So it really, while these diseases have, have different origins, uh, they need to be managed like I need, need to be managed. I need to get off the couch and I need to eat less, less uh, poor quality foods. And, and that's, that's how you, you, you help a horse's health also. Questions? I think that's it. Any other dietary issues that you'd like to discuss from a veterinary standpoint? Diseases that you can think of that you may have dietary questions about? Yes? Wood chewing? Like oh, wood chewing? Wood chewing? Yeah. What about it? Um, I was just interested on how you determine whether it's more than you or are you with the structure of the but how you recognize the nutrient. Yeah, I, I don't know that you, I don't know that you can. I think you look at the diet, and, you, and if the diet is normal, what happens is, what happens with these guys is, I don't think horses wake up in the morning and say, I want you would. Yeah. I think somewhere along their life, 
they can dump this out of boredom. You can have excellent nutrition, but again, if you feed him uh, two times a day and they're bored all day long, they may well chew wood. Um, and I don't think most of the wood chewers have any uh, do it because they're searching for some nutrient that they're not getting. They're searching for food that they're not getting. They're either bored or want to chew something because that's what they do. You know, they, they, they can't read novels and they don't have hands. So they, they, they're busy in their oral animals. So they're, they're doing that, and sometime in their lives, they've either been bored or malnourished or both, and they develop that habit. Some of those habits are very hard to break, whether it's stall weaving, cribbing, chewing wood. Some of the things are, are very hard to break. Can they be recurrent? So if, like, if you think you've broken the habit, can you just make sure you Oh, yeah, that, absolutely. And again, the best way to break the habit is kick the horse out of the pasture. Yeah. You know, just kick them out. And you can, you can help. Some of the worst cribbers will go right over to a fence post and start cribbing right out of 10 acre fashion because they, they, it's just indoctrinated and that's what, that's what they do. But uh, you can break a lot of habits just by getting more sound. Mm -hmm. That habit may come back and then you put them in the salt for 12 hours. Yeah. But I think, I think the majority of those habits are not related to a current malnutrition. There may have been something, as long as the horse is in decent body condition and, and mm -hmm. fed decently, they're not looking for micro nutrients, I don't think. I think, I think mentally they're bored and they've developed this habit either now or, or sometime in the past that it's hard to work. Okay. What else, guys? Nothing to know of stuff to jump with? I actually read a journal last night and they said that behavioral disorders like crib biting can be caused if you feel worse around like four times. Like, it's, it made it sound like the more you feed a horse, the higher the chances of them doing it. But I thought it's better if you feed them more. Yeah, I'm not familiar with, the, with, with that article, but yeah. I think it would be hard pressed to find somebody that wouldn't tell you that okay. feeding more and more frequently and making it a challenge for the horse okay. is a good thing. It's not a good thing. That's a good thing. Okay, they, is, yeah. That they're most of the time uh, in an environment in a stall that that is not a normal environment for them, and they need to be stimulated. And is, is there like an increased risk in the show horses and foals for like providing? Just Certainly the, in, in horses that are, are small. Okay, right. You just don't find a lot of mustangs cribbing. Okay. You know, or zebras cribbing, or, or not very often. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you find it in horses that are, that are bored, stall, intermittently fed. Mm -hmm. It's difficult problem to break. Much easier to prevent than this to cure. To, to break, yeah. How how could you go about curing it? Well, the, you know, there, we're talking about cribbing. You know, you use things like cribbing straps. There are surgeries you can do. Okay. Uh, so there are there are things you can do to minimize it. But what you're doing really is putting band-aid on the problem. You put a cribbing strap on the horse's board in the stall, and you may be able to prevent it from doing this kind of thing. But you haven't done anything for the board. Okay. So the real the real solution is. Get, get his mind occupied, get him other things to do. Many times the other thing to do is just to play hey. It'll be turned down. Okay. And what kind of surgeries would you do? There's a myectomy, you can cut the muscles that, 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 oh, that, okay. that, that do that. It, it's, it has very results. You, it, it does help a lot of horses, but, okay. but it, again, it doesn't do anything for uh, the problem. Okay. You fix the symptom, uh, you've hidden the symptom of boredom, essentially. Oh yeah, well I wouldn't say they happen every day. Um, we, we've done a few of them at the office, uh, but they don't happen every day. We try to manage them in a different way. Yeah. The most common way to manage them is, is a cribbing strap. Yeah. But again, we really try to counsel people that the horse has picked up a bad habit because it had nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. Wild horses in a big pad, or horses in a big pasture that are raised in, our, in herds have much less of these type problems. You don't see worth many horses standing out with their flock or with their herd in a large pasture beating no. or cribbing or walking in circles. You put them in a stall and they have crawl hours and do nothing. It's gonna be, they're, they're gonna do something, whether it's chew on the wood, we stall walk, crib. Uh, you, you can run into psychogenic uh, water drinkers. Uh, not uncommon at all for me to get a complaint if phone rings and somebody says my horse stalls wet every day, he's drinking. 20, 25 gallons of water a day, and he's sick, he must have a kidney disease. And he doesn't. He's 
bored to death, you've got nothing else to do, so he drinks water. They have psychogenic water drinkers. Or there'll be psychogenic salt liquors, which make them drink water, which make them feel a lot more phony. But that's a, that's a psychological problem. You certainly have to determine whether it's kidney disease or Cushing's disease. Uh, but uh, kidney disease is very rare in the Cushing's disease is fairly common, but so is psychogenic water, water drinking and, and, and salt liquor. Uh, another thing that will fool people sometimes is when you switch from a, from a grass hay to an alfalfa hay because you, you, you've got the nitrogen.